Hello, future bestsellers. Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world today. We are um, excited to get writing today. I've had, I had kind of a weird week this week. Like I've been very productive, but I have not done any writing and I'm itching to get to it today. You know how that is? Like where you end up with like a bunch of, you know, other crap that you have to do. Yeah. So much other crap. <laughs> I know there is so much other crap. I keep like going through these things where I try to like purge as much unnecessary, like non writing stuff as I possibly can. But uh, there's mm. just so much, right. There's just so much that has to be done. So, yeah. all right. So uh, let's uh, say hi to everybody and uh, do our introductions. And then we will hop into our very first five minute sprint. Uh, you guys, thank you so much for being here today. We are very happy to see you. Let's start today with Michelle. Tell us a little about you and your awesome channel. All right. I'm Michelle Schusterman. I write middle grade and young adult novels. And my channel is Writing Workshops, Traditional Publishing Chat, and Writing Vlogs. Thank you so much for being here as always. And also, Robert, tell us a little about you and your awesome. I'm so like spazzy today. Uh, Robert, tell us a little about you and your awesome channel. My awesome channel is The Story Detective, where I put various forms of storytelling under a Sherlockian microscope and break down the craft to make the viewer's journey easier. And new videos will be coming soon. I am slowly plotting my way through redesigning things for my channel and social media in general. So by spring, I should have been, some things ready to go. Wow. Well, that's spring, but, you know, <laughs> I do. That's fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic. I, um, I am very much looking forward to getting some writing done today. If you guys don't know me, I'm Lisa Daly. And on my channel, we talk about how to write a book you're super proud of and get it published. And I write contemporary romance, primarily rom-coms and nonfiction advice. Let's say hi to our friends in the chat before we do our first five minute warm up sprint. Wait, hold on. RC was first. Yay. Congratulations, RC. <laughs> Look for your prize pack in the mail. No. <laughs> Great job. Devin's here. Hello, Devin. We are super, super happy to see you. Abby's here. So glad to see you today. Lysanda's here. Hello. We got everybody here today. Michael's here. Hello, Michael. Glad to see you. Victoria, so glad to see you today. Good morning, Swinton and Daisy. Lainey, good morning today. I have a much better attitude about my revision. Oh, Lainey, I'm so happy to hear that. Do tell, how did you get from feeling cranky about your revision to feeling good about it? Is it just the amount of progress you've made so far and like, hey, this is a really good book after all? Or is it like, whoo I'm almost to the end. What's making you feel better about your revision? Dying to know. Uh, where's RV Michelle today? That beach at Santa Barbara was glorious. It was. Uh, <laughs> We're in Carmel today, Carmel, California. Oh, another really beautiful area. It so is so pretty. Beautiful. You guys are just living the life, man. <laughs> living the van life. The yeah. all the way through is through. So true, especially when it comes to editing. I'm doing some formatting today mm. uh, using Atticus for anybody who um, has not done that in the past. Super easy. I really like it. Um, although I always feel like I feel a weird source of sense of guilt because most of the indie pub authors that I, um, that I know and that I work with as clients use um, vellum. Is it Vella or Vellum? One, they're so close. Vella, Vella Vellum. Anyway, really? it's a Mac only. It makes beautiful books. Mm. And I have not. <laughs> I have not. I like tried it out, but it wasn't as easy for me as Atticus. I'd already paid for Atticus. So I still use Atticus. And I like Atticus a lot. But there are, I, so I have some friends who, um, who have done some like insanely, insanely beautiful books. Swinton loves Atticus. Lainey loves Vellum. <laughs> right? They're both great. They, I mean, I really, I think Vellum has a lot more options as far as design. Atticus, though, man, super easy to use. So I think they both have great. But I, I I'm eventually going to have to do this. 
Avi wants to know, is anybody going to do NaNoWriMo in April as March is coming to a close? I am curious. Not me. Not me either. I, yeah. <laughs> I am doing Readers Take Denver in April, so I'm excited about that. <laughs> uh, but no, no NaNo for me. No NaNo for me. Uh, late, how about you guys in the chat? Let us know if you're planning on doing little nano this April. Lainey says, I love that we all have a formatting product that we love, right? <laughs> Absolutely true. All right, you guys, let's go ahead and get started with our five minute warm up sprint. And then when we come back, we'll chit chat for just a few minutes and then we will jump right into our 20 minute sprints today. I'm super excited to get writing. I will tell you why when we come back. All right, here we go, everybody. <laughs> Getting ready in three, two, get those drinks ready, get your doctor's over. Five minute warm up sprint starting now.
All right. Very nice. Thanks so much. Uh, so how did everybody do on that first little warm up sprint? And what are you planning on working on today? Oops, I got something going on back here. Hold on. There we go. Uh, so what are you guys working on today uh, for our writing sprints? <laughs> I'm spazzed today. I'm really like being a dork. I apologize. I'm not sure. I think it, I don't know. I have no reason <laughs> for why this is happening to me today. Let's start with Robert. Robert, what are you going to be working on today? I am editing my novel. There's a couple of things I saw <laughs> much writing done yesterday that I'm revising and adding from a previous chapter and then moving forward from there. Excellent. Awesome. How about you, Michelle? What are you going to be working on today? I've got two ghostwriting uh, clients. I'm going back and forth between them today. I feel that. I have one that I'm working on finishing. I thought I was going to get finished by this past week, but it's been a little bit slower. So it's going to take me an extra couple of weeks to get it done. But I'm very excited about it. Uh, today, I'm going to be working on um, formatting. Um, so which is why we talked earlier about Atticus versus Vellum versus versus. So anyway, that'll be my big thing. But what we were saying earlier about like, I have felt like itchy to write all week because I have had just a pile up of all these other things that mm -hmm. I had to take care of. And so I would love to talk to you guys about everybody in the chat and hear um, about what kind of strategies you use to get your non-writing author stuff done. Like, how do you organize that? You're trying to do a little bit every day. Do you batch it all and do it once a week or once a month or whatever? Like, if anybody has a strategy for how they handle this, I would love to hear about this today. Um, so let's go through the chat a little bit, and then you guys can tell me what your thoughts are on the matter. Swinton says, April Nano is always a revision month for me. Cool. Very nice. Miss Texas, you didn't miss much. Just the warm up. We're very glad you're here, though. Uh, Abby is not going to do na nano either, but fun fact, I have a nano nephew going to be five in April and soon to be nano niece too in July. Uh, right through, uh, that's adorable. I uh, write throughout the year instead of only during nano months anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Various and Sundry is going to be outlining a dark, an adult dark fantasy novel. Ooh, very nice. Eddie's here. Hello, Eddie. Very glad to see you today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, so, Michelle, oh, you're working on a ghostwriting project. And Robert, you are working on your novel today, not yes. the. Uh, okay, fantastic. You guys let us know in the chat what you're going to be working on today, but we are going to get rolling with our very first writing sprint. It is always already 1115 Eastern, so we want to make sure we get some good writing done. I was very excited to be here today. All right, everybody, here we go. So we are going to start with our very first 20 minute sprint uh, of the day. Uh, make sure you are drinking that water and taking deep breaths, stretch those little fingers and let's get going. Here we go. Starting in three, two, one, let's sprint.
All right. Welcome back, everybody. So that was really loud. Uh, so how did everybody do on our first sprint? Feeling good? good? Yeah, pretty good. All right. Fantastic. Absolutely delightful. Um, so my question was, oh, hold on just one second. Sorry, I've got like a Shopify ad popping up on our thing. Okay. So uh, how do you guys manage scheduling your non-writing author tasks? That was our question, our first question we're tackling today. And it's my question. Uh, I'm dying to hear your advice on the topic. I, I feel like I have just like so... Uh, so much of that stuff lately that's not writing. Um, so somebody had said, let me just see if I can find it. Oh, here we go. So Avi says, I hate mundane stuff, so I batch it and gamify it to make it fun. Playing music while answering emails, listening to podcasts for repeat tasks I can do on autopilot, role playing while working, etc. I love that. I think that's great. There's, I actually just read, um, an article about something called temptation bundling, which means that you bundle the crap you hate to do like laundry with stuff you love to do, like watching reruns of Bridgerton. And so you <laughs> combine those things together yes. and right. And it's sort of, uh, and so you look forward to it more, or at least it makes the whole thing more palatable, which I, you know, in some ways we probably already do that, but there is in fact a name for it if you weren't aware, and this is a strategy you've been using. So temptation bundling, I think is genius. And, uh, let us know if you guys do that. Um, all right. So various and sundry does Pomodoro's. That's essentially the same as our little writing sprints here where we do uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 minute sprints. Uh, I think that that is really good. And actually it's kind of shocking that, um, that it, it's, <laughs> it's kind of shocking that once you actually sit down to do all that stuff that you've been, you know, that you've been putting off, which I think I'd read somewhere recently was called a needle list or a needling list where it's the stuff that's like constantly bugging you in your mind, but mm -hmm. you do, right. You spend way more time worrying about not doing it than it would take to, yeah, then it would actually do it. So. I had a day like that a couple weeks ago where it was like the worst kind. I mean, I had to like register to vote in Washington and because I was registered in Texas, right. which required filling out a form of mailing in an oh no. Um, and like some stuff with like my health insurance and some, some bills I had to pay and things that were on my to-do list every day. And I never did them cause I was dreading them. And then one afternoon I was like, screw this, I'm going to do them all. And it took like 30 minutes. <laughs> I was like, why, <laughs> why have I been letting this take up so much space in my head? It was actually so easy. <laughs> That's the thing. It takes up so much space in your head when you have things like that, where yeah. it, you're constantly ruminating. This is what, like, whenever I go on a trip, I always write down every single thing I'm going to need to pack. And I start doing this like a couple days out before yeah. I actually start packing. Because otherwise, I would just constantly ruminate about all the stuff I needed to take. Did I remember to put this in? Da, da, da. And I found that if I just wrote it down, I was like, oh, it's on the list. Or I'll write that on the list. And that way I won't forget. And that like took a big, you know, it took a lot of stress off and it was just a simple thing, but it's my brain. Like, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. And that's the same kind of thing. Yeah. Even if you have like this to-do list, it mm -hmm. occupies a lot of brain space. I yes. have two different thoughts. Yes. One is the things that's beyond control. And sometimes life just pulls you in a direction for days that you just have no, no control or decision over. In which case I try to write things down and I always remind myself that a delay can be beneficial because your mind is still churning subconsciously and working on stuff. True. As long as the delay doesn't go for more than three days. If I delay more than three days, then I have to kickstart myself and then it's a pain in the butt and I'm not very happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that makes so. Go ahead. But my morning tasks, it's like earbuds in and I'm listening to Audible. I'll toss in a pile of laundry and then I'm cooking breakfast and I'm learning to multitask and get through things while I'm still listening to something. Mm -hmm. And I feel like my time isn't completely chewed up doing just mundane tasks. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think, and, and I do think the idea of like batching things or scheduling, like, okay, on Wednesday mornings, I do this, or at least like we all show up here to write, um, right. right. That, that sometimes scheduling a block for those kinds of things. But I am, I am the queen of writing like boring need to be done tasks that will probably take me 15 minutes on my thing and just roll on my to-do list and just rolling them over day to day to day until, you know, it's been weeks. So yeah, part of it is just like overwhelmed sometimes where you have way too many tasks for the amount of life that you have. Yeah. Uh, I love this. Avi says, I love temptation bundling. If I try to do laundry while watching Bridgerton reruns, I'd be sitting on dirty laundry watching Bridgerton <laughs> in no time. <laughs> Word. I understand that completely. I have been there myself, but it's the closest I can come. All right. So uh, let me just go back. All right. So uh, we were talking about what everybody's going to be doing today. Stacy's going to be combining some drafts after lunch. Uh, Lasanda, love, love, love this, right? L Lasanda's doing camp, working on two projects, draft two of one, draft three of the other. Small town romance scene, or so much, blah, 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 small town romance series. Lasanda polishing one of my final scenes in the fake dating romance. So excited about that because you know fake dating is one of my very favorite tropes. Uh, so reading critique partner uh, notes. Eddie's got Beauty and the Beast retelling. I love it. My angle is that it's based in real history, kind of like Ever After with Drew Barrymore, Angelica Houston. Can I say that's one of my favorite Cinderella retellings? I I I love so. And she probably still has this, although she seems like she's more talk show and less acting these days. But Drew Barrymore has this like thing that she does in movies, this sort of ethereal look that she gets. And I thought it was such a good um, she was just so lovely in that. If you if you enjoy a good Cinderella retelling and you have not seen Ever After, you will very much enjoy that one. Ray is here. Hello. We are super, super glad to see you. Hello, Heather. We're very glad to see you. Ooh, Various had a nice aha moment that's making my outline going well. Ooh, I love it when that happens. Also, what are some kinds of non-writing author tasks? So when I'm talking about non-writing author tasks, I'm talking about like making your reservations for conferences and things like promotion stuff like setting up you know uh sale prices and promotions or uh, which is stuff that's like labor intensive and kind of boring um uh things like social media things like you know just all that kind of stuff anybody else want to name some some non-writing author tasks book design like managing cover artists and editors and things like that anybody else that kind of stuff those are the things like yeah. oh, did i make my hotel reservation for that conference oh did i do this oh did i do that and just like looking at you know posting social media and doing things like that branding yes yes absolutely bookkeeping. right i use fresh books for my bookkeeping and mostly it's pretty smooth but um yes absolutely Rolling over tasks day after day. Heather does not do that. No, <laughs> Heather does do that. I see the little winky face. I know. Media, that's another one. And uh, that's one that I'm <sighs> pondering now and trying to figure out a schedule as well as what I'm going to actually do this time around. It's different than what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's the thing is like you, there are some things. So a couple of years ago, uh, during the last RAM conference, one of the sort of themes that we heard over and over again was RAM is romance author, romance author mastermind. This is Sky Warren's conference. It's phenomenal if you have, ever have the opportunity to go. Um, but one of the things that we heard over and over again from the speakers was this idea of only do what only you can do. That basically you should farm out any of the work that you do not need to be doing, a.k.a non-writing stuff should go to an assistant or a small child you can <laughs> you can borrow <laughs> beg borrow or steal etc and 
I, and I came home from that, like, okay, I'm going to do this. And so I offloaded a bunch of stuff. But what I found was that I felt very disconnected and I spent a lot more time managing other people than I like to do. And so I'm at this thing, like, oh, I don't want to do all this work, but also I don't want to manage all these people. And that is not like you have to do one or the other, I think. So anyway, anybody else? I love this. Avi says, love ever after that. Just breathe, sing at the ball, scene at the ball gets me. And the facts that she saves herself before he can rescue her. Right? Feminist Cinderella. Love, love, love. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Texas, she says, lady, that's what you have an account sister for. Very nice. Ray is trying to make a new writing schedule routine, but I'm struggling with it. I've been having health issues, poss possible narcolepsy, as well as puppy training and organizing a new house. So you already have just a massive plate of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, it's challenging for sure. I mean, I, I feel like that my sort of strategy through the years, whenever I have been overwhelmed with a bunch of other things, whether it's like family stuff or health stuff or just, or client work where you just, something's happened with your workflow. And Michelle, you can probably speak to this a little bit. So you and I both do like ghostwriting and um, Robert does editing. I do book coaching. So we have, in addition to our own work, some client work, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes what happens, and I, I don't, maybe it's less like this for you, but I have, but it's probably more like this for Robert, that somebody like reserves you or says, okay, I want to do this project and I'm going to start March 1st. And you mm -hmm. go, okay. And you schedule stuff around that. Oh, like, okay, I'm not going to take my next project till April 1st. But then what happens is your March 1st person is delayed for some reason or there's some problem and then all of a sudden you have two books that you have to get done or three mm -hmm. books or 17 books that you have to get done no. but you know what i mean like it's even if you are really trying to be organized and not over schedule yourself sometimes things just and it's not just with clients oh. sometimes right there's some stuff with us where you're constantly like juggling you know time and and yeah I, it's also trying to um you know, keep a schedule to work on my own stuff at this point. And it can be strange when you're thinking of booking for the coming year, because I have a book like next November mm -hmm. that's slated for and, you know, should be OK because she's usually like clockwork. But um, you just never know. <laughs> you never do. You never, you never, ever do. And I think that that's like and there are times where I get people you know, schedule for stuff and then, um, and everybody turns their stuff in on time or whatever, and there are no delays. And, you know, sometimes there are publisher delay. I mean, there are all kinds of delays. So it's, but what happens is you end up with a big pile of work that's really challenging to get through. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and hard to plan for. So that's a challenge. All right. Well, anybody who has advice on that, right, on basically the whack-a-mole that is the author life, let us know. We like to hear your good, uh, your, your good. <laughs> I'm generally very organized, but I feel like if you throw like one extra thing, like a health problem, which I've had some this year, um, that that kind of throws everything else off. Okay. Various has a great question here. I'm looking to attend writing, reading lit conventions this summer, ideally in June, July, anywhere in the U S it seems like not a lot of them have confirmed dates yet. Um, what genre of conference, because if they're summer conferences, you're going to start seeing some dates pretty quickly. Um, I know that with most author conferences that, um, that, like the authors have to sign up pretty far in advance or, you know, pitch panels and things like that. So any genre. Okay. Um, so there are lots in this. Uh, <laughs> I could just give you a whole list. Actually, I'll do that. I'll give you a list when we come back from our next sprint. I'll give you some, uh, a list. It, it really depends though. Like I do think there's a real benefit to genre specific, um, uh, conferences. I, I think that um, those can be so adva advantageous because you're meeting other authors in your genre, you're meeting like, you know, reviewers in your genre, book lovers in your genre. And it feels like to me, it sort of magnifies anything that you can get. Um, 
But if you're just like, oh, I'm not quite sure what I want to do yet, and I want to check it all out, I will have some advice for you when we come back. Heather, we're going to cover yours too. Um, yes, I am planning on speaking at Orlando Reads Books this year. Um, I had not looked at the conference date. I know Nink um, is supposed to open today too for registration if you guys are planning on doing that, but that's not till September. Okay, let's go ahead and do our first 20 minute writing sprint. Is it our first? No, it's our second. See mm -hmm. what's happening in my brain today. <laughs> okay, let's do our second 20 minute writing sprint. And when we come back, we are going to talk conferences, which are my favorite things to talk. I love conferences. I'm such a like conference nerd. All right, everybody, here we go. Let's get started uh, in three, two, one. Let's cha cha.
So I totally lost my screen. I could not find the StreamYard screen back, which is sort of funny. I got very into my last sprint on that one. Uh, how did you guys do on the on the last sprint? Good. Very good. Excellent. Comets here. Hello. We are very, very happy to see you. Maz is here. Very nice. Very hard to organize when you're ill. Sympathies. Oh, thank you so much. I also like scary books. Okay. Good to know. All right. Um, various rights, fantasy and LGBT fiction, but I like literary fiction and mystery. I did not put a fantasy conference in there, um, but I will, uh, I'll see if I can find a good one, but I did drop a number of other ones. Thriller Fest is a great one for mystery uh, and thriller. Um, West Coast Crime is great, but that happens in April. Um, and I, I just put a bunch. I put like several. So there are a gazillion though. You can just search for like fantasy writing conference July or something like that or fantasy. And I'm sure there must be um, LGBT both conferences and reader events. And that would be a, a really, really great place to um, to meet some, you know, some readers vixen and sort of establish establish yourself in that genre um vixen finish my morning work about start editing on my next draft yay fantastic uh ray uh blah 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 so <laughs> ray got to i'm sorry i lost my train of thought i apologize it wasn't the blah blah wasn't you it was what was going on in my brain uh 222 words yay that's awesome. Uh, various, I put it in the chat. I guess it'd be in Facebook or over on my channel, which is Best Selling Author Writing Coach, if you are watching this on either Robert or uh, Michelle's channel. But I will drop the list into the description uh, by the end of the. Um, blah. <laughs> By the end of the stream. Good Lord, I'm having problems with words today. Maybe it's good I haven't had time to write all week. My goodness. All right. Or maybe this is what happens to me if I don't write. Or you know what it is? It's because I ran out of my little Nareva vitamins today, which are for your brain. Clearly, I need them. Um, okay. Miss Texas G writes, rom-coms with my characters are over 40. You know who else? I love that. You know who else writes... Um, uh, well, she does, her characters are younger, but she writes um, her rom coms are set in the '90s. Karen Gray, uh, she yeah, she's she's got really fun. But I love that your characters are over forty, right? Because we need a little romance and and laughs for, right? Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, Lisa's been hitting the bottle pretty hard. It's it's sweet tea today, but yes, absolutely. Um, Okay, so yeah, there we go. Let's go back and look at, we had a good question I was going to go back to, and of course I cannot remember what it was from five minutes ago, but I'm going to go pop back up to that. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, um, Heather had asked if I'm still planning to go speak at Orlando Reads Books this year. The answer is yes, um, and unless there's some some conflict but i think i'm okay because the other conference that i go to around that time of year is at the end of september so i should be okay and i really liked you i was supposed to go last year and i got covid so i'm very happy to go back again what about you guys are you planning on doing michelle i know you do a lot of like school events mm -hmm. do you do conferences too i mean i i've done a lot of conferences it has been a while actually the last conference i moderated a middle grade mystery panel at the north texas teen author fest which is huge That's literally amazing. like i mean the week before quarantine it was like the thing where that period of time where it was in the news and we all kind of felt it coming but it hadn't happened and i remember masks and hand sanitizer being put out and people i, I remember going into the bathroom and girls were like washing their hands and singing happy birthday. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like that was like all in our minds. So that was the last thing, the last one I did. I think I, I'm forgetting something. <laughs> it took a while for me. Like it was not until the summer of the vaccine that I went back out. Like I did not do any conferences yeah. for a couple of years. Right. And um, yeah, so I really miss them though. Yeah, I, do. I love conferences so much. I know, right? <laughs> I love them. Robert, um, 
I know you're uh, that you live in uh, New York State, um, and there I know you're also a fan of Writers Digest, and they are having their conference this summer. I think it's in August. I just popped it up actually. Where was it? Writers Digest. Oh, it is August. August seventeenth through the twentieth. That could be a good one for you. Maybe maybe we'll meet there. All right. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's go back to our other comments. Let me see what we've already got. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, the conference that I popped up in London is yearly. There are a number of really good writing conferences in the UK. Mm. Very nice. Thank you very much. Sweet tea is the official drink below the Mason Dixon line. True. Very true. It's funny too, because like in any time I have lived or visited in places, you know, that are more northerly, you ask for sweet tea and they just like hand you regular tea and go like, well, here you go, put some sugar in it. And it's such a culture shock because in the South, everywhere has sweet tea, like you have tea and sweet tea. So anyway, kind of a fun thing. Maz is finally home. Oh, public transport, 25 minutes, uh, 25 minutes late. Uh, I write fantasy, supernatural, whatever my dreams and nightmares send me. I feel that. Definitely feel that. All right. I am super, super excited about this. Let's go ahead and, um, well, before we do that, before we do our next sprint, what's your favorite thing about writers conferences, Michelle? Uh, my favorite thing, it's <laughs> Drinking but, at the bar with authors. No, no, it's, no, actually, my favorite thing is actually the panels and like the interaction and the energy that comes with it. Like, it makes me feel inspired, and hopefully, it makes people who are like aspiring authors also feel inspired. Like, there's nothing like a really good panel, but especially when it includes a QA so the audience is involved. Yeah. Those, when yeah. I think about my favorite moments at conferences I've done in the past, like that was it. I remember the biggest surprise I ever had was I did, um, I don't know, I can't even remember which conference it was, but I, I was on several different panels. And the one that I thought no one would come to was because one, it was like literally at eight in the morning, it was first thing. And two, it was about middle grade and like in the classroom. And this was like a, not Comic Con, but like a fandom kind of convention. Mm -hmm. I was like, come to this, it's going to be lame. Well, it turns out someone put the word out with the local teachers and all of these teachers and librarians came and it was like the best panel I did of the whole. Wow. It's so good. <laughs> so, that, yeah. That is awesome. I love that. I um, love the opportunity to like hang out with my favorite authors and all my author friends for sure. Mm -hmm. But I totally agree with you. Like there is some sort of like hopeful empowered inspirational vibe that just permeates most conferences and that is what i go for like that yeah. kind of juice can like yeah. really inspire you for um for mm -hmm. a while to come so robert i know you have lots of experiences with conferences have you done a lot of like conferences in general just from your days of it, uh, it, at marvel it, 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 it's been a minute since I've actually done the public thing, but the same thing applied for me. When when you go out in public and people come there, you, you kind of know that they're looking for advice in those Q&A. So it's different than doing it online. So there is a different energy. Mm -hmm. And yes, that was a big thing for me, just helping people and pointing them yeah. in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So Maz, I just put, um, I just dropped it in the chat over on my channel. So if you're on Michelle or Robert's channel, um, you'll have to pop over to mine. But after this, I will go ahead and add it to um, the video description uh, in like before the end of the thing. I'll do it actually on this next uh, deal. It's not a comprehensive list. It's It was just, I was sort of to kind of trying to hit a little, little of everything for conferences that happened over the summer uh, because that's what we were, um, that's what we were looking for. Eddie, Dr. Pepper. Yeah, right. That very much is a thing. Uh, okay. Avi's got a question. What, who inspired you to become an author? For me, it was Enid Blyton, Agatha Christie, and Jane Austen. I love this question. Uh, Robert, I'm going to start with you. Um, initially, it was Stephen King because I wanted to write horror um, quite early on. I mean, I was writing, you know, my own comic books and stories. So a lot of comic book writers and artists who are too numerous to mention 
but then when I discovered Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes, that inspired me to write my first novel, which was a mystery. Mm. Love that. How about you? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm trying to really, like really think back because I, I know this is such a typical answer, but I was writing stories as early as I could remember, like writing yeah. little by a notebook and it was my book and I was like writing about right. usually horses and mysteries. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. Definitely author see- author yeah. of the Mr. Gemeinhart Chronicles here. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> but, um, was like, like old fashioned. Yeah. My um, grandfather was an old fashioned storyteller. So he started telling me stories before I could actually write. So he inspired me to write short stories and stuff when I was in school. So I was almost doing like my version of his stories when I was a little kid. But yeah, as long as I can remember, I've been writing stories as well. So yeah, I love (laughs) that. Go ahead, Michelle, what you're going to say. The first book I really remember reading where I was like, uh, there's two in high school, reading Jane Eyre. That was a big one. And then Chris Claiborne, that was my first Stephen King book and led to like, nearly a decade of reading primarily Stephen King mm. and through the dark catalog and Dean Koontz they they got me into like like dark sci-fi speculative just speculative like that you know and then also and I I almost hate to say this now but it's it's the truth when I actually started writing a novel with the intent to be published was after reading Harry Potter ah I love it's, that it, yeah. Yes. I know. Well, there are a lot of people who were inspired to yeah. read or write because of Harry Potter. So um, we can definitely take that little, you know, piece, wonderful little piece of that, that there are many new authors because of, um, of those books. So for me, it was a weird combination of Dave Barry, who is a, a um, humor writer who used to have a newspaper column. He probably still does, but nobody reads the newspaper anymore, unfortunately. So Dave Barry and William Shakespeare together and Jane Austen as far as romance. And then later, I will say, um, oh, my God, what was her name? Jackie Collins. Smutty. That was like the first like kind of smutty stuff I read as like a kid, like pretty smutty for me, at least when I that I read as like a teenager. Or Yeah. Anyway, so the funny thing about. Shakespeare and Dave Barry was that I was in some, I don't know, elementary or middle school English class. And I remember like talking about, I don't know, like grammar rules or punctuation rules or something. We, I had a really strict kind of awful writing teacher that or English teacher that year and like n- not a creativity friendly writing teacher. <laughs> and I had this sort of epiphany because we were, she was very much about the rules, but we were reading Shakespeare at the time. And I remember going and thinking that for me, I was like, well, he doesn't follow the rules where he doesn't follow the rule, like all the time thinking that. And then looking at a Dave Barry column who also did not follow any rules of writing that I had ever seen as a whatever fifth, sixth grader, whatever it was. And, um, and thinking like, okay, I could write the way that I want to write. Like I, I found this connection between Dave Barry and William Shakespeare. Here's a funny thing. I met Dave Barry many, many years later after my first or second book had come out at a writing conference at Book Expo or something. And I told him that the reason that, um, that I had become a writer was because of him and Shakespeare together. Mm-hmm. And he thought that I know he thought that was really funny. <laughs> so it's a way he's like, Oh yeah, I get that comparison all the time. I'm pretty sure that he was pulling my leg, but it was kind of a funny experience. Yay. Anyway. Yay. Love, love, love that. All right. So uh, Eddie Lane, Charles Dickens for me and Jane, the stone cold Austin. Love Jane Austen. <laughs> love, love, love. And you know, what's crazy. My daughter loves Jane Austen. She has like, her book is all like annotated and we, yeah. Anyway, love, 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 love. Jane Austen, Jane Austen, Jane Austen. Absolutely. Yes. I think that she is sort of the staple, just like Stephen King is like the guy for a lot of um, horror writers and even like mystery writers. Jane Austen for romance writers is she's yes. our queen. She's our queen bee. Jane Ooh, Austen Michael's period language, too, because when I started watching period pieces and researching like uh, 
first Victorian England and then going back to the Jane Austen stuff, when I first started reading that, I'm like, wow, this is really interesting language and the way the story flows. So, you know, even for a non-romance author, I think Jane Austen is very well worth your time. She was super smart. Like for me, I really connected with, um, with Elizabeth Bennett and I'd love like Jane Austen's very smart and her writing's very clever and the banter and is, she, she's just funny. And I don't, I just really connected. And I think a, readers connect with her work in a variety of different ways, but yeah. um, you know, sort of pushing up against the patriarchy and a million other things, mm -hmm. but yeah, we love her. A thousand great books has a spectacular um, education. Uh, Dostoevsky, Albert Camus, uh, Kafka, Joyce. Yeah, good job. Very nice. You, you, you're you well educated and uh, lit thick. Is that what you're writing? I'm kind of dying to know now. I can't remember. Uh, various love, speculative fiction. Love, love, love that. <laughs> hey, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks <laughs> William Shakespeare the 403rd uh yeah um oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah Jane Eyre was definitely life-changing yeah Ooh, Chris Colfer American Girl Historical Books yep. Love those. <laughs> yes yeah absolutely yep. Piers Anthony um oh oh here we go I feel like I saw it. um there we go. Now I'm super inspired by Elizabeth. Is it Acevedo? I'm not familiar with how to pronounce her last name. Um, he is a Floridian. Very nice. The horror geek pops in here. Um, speaking of childhood books, okay, raise your hand or drop a comment. We're going to do one more writing sprint before we go. Raise your hand or drop a comment if you wrote stories when you were a kid, like whether you're stapling together little pieces of notebook paper or right, right here, or that. I will tell you for a fact that the Horror Geek had an epic series about the adventures of Super Duck. <laughs> Epic, <laughs> freaking epic! And when we and when we moved, his um, uh, his mom like dropped off a box of his stuff, and the um, and the Super Duck stories were amongst them. And I will say, the 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 guy, the horror geek, was destined to be a writer from, you know, from very young age. Yeah, I Love. saved all that stuff too for me. <laughs> the first homemade comic I made was um, around Halloween, and my brother and I dressed up in. Halloween costumes as superheroes and had a trick or treat adventure. <laughs> love that. I love that. That is so awesome. Uh, Devin read a lot of R.L. Stein and Christopher Pike. Oh my gosh. Love, love, yes, love that. Me too. Yeah, absolutely. Maz says role playing games made me want to start writing novels. I previously wrote poetry. I used to tell myself stories as a kid. Love that. Ver oh, this is like so much fun. I uh, various wrote stories in the first grade with little wallpaper and cardboard book covers. Oh my God, that's so sweet. <laughs> Oh, I love this, Victoria. That is that is absolutely so great. Avi says you should write a romance where the male lead like Shakespeare and the female lead like Dave Barry. <laughs> Avi, you are like so full of great ideas. I yeah, totally like love that. <laughs> love, love, love. There's a great podcast about a teenager who ran away from home to live with Piers Anthony. <laughs> fascinated <gasps> Lainey right I, I I also had a teacher like that which is kind of you have some teachers that will like let you stay in on recess and produce one of your you know written home written plays for the yeah. entire class and then you have the person who's going to call your mother because you're being too creative yeah. I'm sorry for every writer who has experienced the latter because it sucks I I'm so sorry Lainey Thank goodness you didn't listen to her. I have my friend Lisa O. McLeod, who's a nonfiction writer, who is who has like, after having a spectacular career as an author and um, business consultant, has decided to go to like this special film school at the University of Georgia. And um, and she is literally working with industry professionals to write a pilot, which I am just 
blown like i just think this is the most i know but she had a writing she had like an english teacher when she was a kid who told her she could never be an author because she was a bad speller and her she didn't have very nice handwriting and i was like how many kids were like okay (laughs) i know i think i i she's incredibly bright i believe just as a person who's been her friend for like 20 plus years that she had like um a sort of mild form of undiagnosed dyslexia. She just, they're just words that she just doesn't, can't spell. And that's okay. That's what spell check is for. Thank goodness. And if you cannot spell and you have terrible penmanship, neither of these things will keep you from being an author. Eddie's first one called Hazel Snapdragon. Love it. Read it when I was, wrote it when I was eight. Lasonda has been writing since, uh, since, uh, she was a kid. I can totally believe that about you because you are always like cranking out those stories. Texas G, Miss Texas G. Not only did I write stories when I was a kid, my really great seventh grade teacher produced one of them for our class. Oh. I love that. So nice. That's the teacher that changed a whole bunch of lives. I mean, wow, yeah. that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hate it when pre- bad teachers, uh, some like the idea of writing and being creative and others, you know, same with family members. Mm-hmm. Like be, most were non-supportive, but some of them were kind of funny. Like my grandmother, when I'd be sitting at her dining room table on a summer afternoon working on my stuff and she'd be like, you've got to go outside and get some sun. <laughs> I, I didn't listen, obviously. because obviously. <laughs> uh, Well, and now we know that sun causes skin <laughs> cancer and here you are an author. So there you go. Um, yeah. My grandmother like thought that there was nothing greater than being an author. And so like you, there was nothing you could do that was better than that. And so um, I had this like, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like I had this sort of shield against any, you know, any naysayers when I was, because my grandmother, like, always wanted an author in the family. Although I will say my whole family was super, super supportive. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure William Shakespeare, not a Floridian, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, I think there's some truth to that. Although there's some really wonderful teachers. Oh, I love this. I created a fake magazine in high school called Teen Week, written for teens by teens, and they used an article in my end of ex- oh, I love that. That's so great. Ah. <laughs> Michael, you're awesome. Um, oh, thank you so much. Oh, I have advice on this. So Ooh. one, it takes more, well, we should all like weigh on, weigh in on this question. So, um, Trini Lizzie, which I love that name. That's so cute. And also your avatar is adorable. Um, I have two things to say on this and I would like Michelle and Robert to also weigh in on it. Should you start an author YouTube channel instead of promoting only on Instagram? So one, YouTube takes a bunch of time, but on the other hand, it really is a fantastic platform and it, allows you to reach people that you wouldn't necessarily reach on Instagram. So I think that if you have the time, energy, inclination, and you're comfortable with, you know, filming and editing, or even if you're like just willing to learn, you don't have to start comfortable. um, I think YouTube can be really fantastic. And second, I love giving writing advice and going to conferences and speaking at events and things like that was one of the main reasons why I wanted to start a YouTube channel because I felt like then I could sort of do that for the masses and um, and it kind of kind of fulfilled this need of mine to give back. However, if you want to promote your books, I don't think an author tube channel is a great way to do it. I think you should review books in your genre because then you're creating an audience of readers versus an mm-hmm. audience of writers. Yeah. And so, and you can see even just in our chat here today, we have such a, I mean, we all, the three of us all write different things. You know, Robert's writing historical and nonfiction. Michelle is writing a lot of um, middle grade and now some adult mystery and you know and here i'm over romance and nonfiction. so even just in that group and and with all of you today we have so many different um genres and subgenres that people write in so that would be my advice start a channel for readers of your particular genre or subgenre and um and do that to build your audience what say you michelle and robert and i think that's really good advice because the thing is youtube just takes more work than any of the other outlets yeah. and, and it's great but you have to really want to do it. it it's not just a thing you just 
you'll create an account and throw a post up every once in a while. Like a video takes work, you know, a lot more work. Um, and, and I think Lisa, like you said, if you get on there to talk about writing, you're going to attract an audience of writers, which isn't going to translate to a lot of actual readers of your book, you know? So I think that that's great advice to, to create your channel around if you want to do it, your genre or just something more specific to, you know, that's going to attract the people who want to read the kind of book that you write. I don't have anything useful to add. I think that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you added a lot of useful stuff. Robert, what say you? Uh, the same. I would also say when you start a YouTube channel, it is the most work, but it's the most rewarding because, you know, doing a video is a different type of storytelling, so you can learn things from it. But don't True. try to push yourself to YouTube's pace because their algorithm is ever-changing and it will suck you in and it'll become your full-time job if you're not careful. So... Um, you know, do like a video a week or a video every couple of weeks, whatever works for you. And uh, yeah, come up with stuff that's going to be for readers. Come up with some writing stuff. I'm still revamping my ideas for channel um, to get back to. But I, I would say it's the most creative. It's not just sticking something up for a quick little post. You can mm -hmm. actually get what you want to do. And that's the key to everything you know, you're marketing yourself. So yeah. Yeah. I think there's some real truth to that. Uh, Eddie says, I like the idea of reviewing books in your genre on YouTube. Would you then add a plug for your thing at the end? Or is that not classy? So um, funnily enough, when I um, worked in advertising at the very beginning of my writing career uh, as a copywriter, one of the th sort of maxims that you often heard in any uh, creative area was beware of entertaining rather than selling. And I think you could do both at the same time. But if you are creating a YouTube channel to sell your books, then you want to make sure people actually know about your books. And you don't have to make it gross think of it this way. You're not right. You don't have to make it gross. You're essentially just your whole purpose for starting your YouTube channel is to help people uh, who read in your genre find new books to love. And your book can be one of those new books to love. So I would definitely, you know, tag the end of your YouTube videos with something like, you know, Hey, if you love whatever it happens to be, if you love, um, uh, fantasy with strong female characters. You're definitely going to love my new series, blah, blah, blah. And, with, you know, throw it up at the end. It does not have to be like obnoxious. You're just letting it know. But that constant repetition of your, um, of your, you know, books or your series or just you as an author uh, or, you know, a, a call to join your newsletter or a million other things that you could do to sort of keep that contact with people. Um, I, it's not bad or painful, yeah. I don't think. Thoughts. I would also say what comes under the umbrella of the subject that you're writing about and the genre you're writing about and uh, how can you intrigue people in there and then you can work your story into that and promote mm -hmm. without seeming like you're overdoing it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. But don't make the mistake of assuming that if you're re reviewing books that people will automatically figure out that you also are writing books. So like connect the dots mm -hmm. a little bit for them. You're so welcome. Very nice. Oh, Regina says, hi. Getting a manuscript ready for the formatter today. Very, very nice. Oh, good point. Uh, Various says, almost every video has an outro with some sort of call to action. Yes. Michael C.B. Chen would like to see William Shakespeare, Florida resident, <laughs> racing in the Daytona 500. <laughs> and with that, let's do our very last writing sprint. Here we go, everybody. Oops, hold on. I did all that. And now we are on some weird thing. Hold on. That would have been such a great outro if I, or such a great transition if I had it together, wouldn't it? Okay. Last one, everybody. We're going to make this one count. Get those little fingers ready to roll. Super proud of you today. You guys are doing awesome. All right. Here we go, everybody. Last writing sprint, make it count. Starting in three, two, one. Let's cha cha.
All right, there we go. Once again, sorry about that. Once again, I am uh, I was like so into what I was writing that I completely could not find the StreamYard window. Anyway, that is it for us today. Ooh, here we go. Real quick question. What do you call rom-coms with characters over 40? Just rom-coms? I've seen I've seen something called second time around. Not sure what is a good um subgenre. I have also heard second time around, although that sort of implies like or second chance romance, which is sort of applies it implies that they have um you know, that they've gone through a divorce or like the death of a partner or something like that. Like second chance romance is either a second chance for the person to find love or most often second chance with somebody that you started a relationship with, but you didn't finish like a, your first love or something like that. So um, I don't, I can't think of, an, and I'm like, you know me, I love the tropes. Um, I can't think of a title or a, an extra sort of subgenre for rom-coms with characters over 40. But if anybody else has any advice or thoughts on this, um, Lainey, I'm talking to you. Uh, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm going to research this, though. and We could talk about it next week. Actually, let me do a little screenshot real quick so I don't forget. Um, there must be one for sure, but I don't know what it is. But if you can find it, and it's uh, and it's the way that um, readers talk about the trope, then that's like a really great way to like really focus and find your readers. So I'm going to try and do a little research on that. I feel like there must be something, but I am not familiar with what it is. So you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Before we go today, let's go ahead and do our outros really quickly. I am going to start with you, Robert. Okay. Uh, my channel is The Story Detective, where I take various forms of storytelling from my experience in Marvel and my lifetime of writing stories, as we've discussed here today, and put them under a Sri Lankan microscope and break down the craft to make the viewer's journey easier. And hopefully new videos will be coming in the not too distant. <laughs> Yay! Thank you so much for being here as always. Michelle, tell us a little about you and your awesome channel before we go. All right, I'm Michelle Seesterman. I write middle grade and young adult books. My channel is Writing Workshops, Traditional Publishing, Chat, and Writing Blogs. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, for all of you, I am uh, Lisa Daly. And on my channel, we talk about how to write a book you're super proud of and get it published. I write contemporary romance and uh, nonfiction writing and dating advice, although I'm not writing dating advice anymore, but some of my old books are dating advice. Anyway, you guys are awesome. I'm so glad we could all hang out here today and we will see you next Wednesday, same time, same place, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Happy writing, everybody. Take care, everybody, and keep those keyboards clacking. Woohoo! <laughs>